Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the Town Hall in North Beach and welcome to Dr. Eshelman who's going to talk to us today about sinking land and rising seas. Before we start our program, I have a few little housekeeping items to mention. Please turn your cell phone off. We are being recorded. So if you whisper something, there's a really good chance that it will be picked up by our camera and microphone. I always like to let people know this ahead of time. Um, I'd like to introduce our elected officials uh, from the town of Chesapeake Beach. And wait till I've introduced them all to clap. From the town of Chesapeake Beach, I have Council Member Jaworski, if you would stand up, please. We have our former mayor, Mark Frazier. We have Council Member Mickey Hummel, who always helps the museum and records all of the events for us. We have Council Member Greg Dotson. And I thought I saw Gwen, Councilwoman Gwen. Okay. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Bayside History Museum, and I'd like to introduce you to the youth of our museum. If you will look up here, these are the wonderful young people that work at the Bayside History Museum. From left to right, we have Wyatt Garrett, we have Olivia, we have Kat, Jason, and Vincent. Representing the Calvert Library is our wonderful retired library director, Pat Hoffman. And I also need to acknowledge in this audience, because both Dr. Eshelman and his really good friends, Don Schumat, are published, very recognized authors. And it's so nice of Don and his wife to be here today. Okay, without further ado, I want to say a little something about Dr. <coughs> Dr. Eshelman. Ralph is a specialist in polar exploration, military and maritime history, the War of 1812 in Chesapeake Bay, geology and vertebrae paleontology. He has a PhD from the University of Michigan, majoring in geology and vertebrae paleontology. He minored in ecology. And one of the favorite things that so many of us in this audience enjoy, as Ralph goes exploring around the continent, he shares all of his adventures and pictures with many of us on Facebook. And we really do appreciate that, Ralph. Without further ado, Dr. Eshelman. Thank you, Bruce. Also, a big thank you to the Bayside History Museum and also to Calvert County Libraries. You guys have done a great job in doing many, many lecture series, so thank you. What a wonderful turnout. You guys realize the sun is out there and it's a warm day for a change? And here we are, all in here looking at a lecture. And I tend to go long, so Gracie, you get the hook out when I, when I go beyond the time that I should. I want to start out by asking everyone here, and I'd like you to be honest. How many folks here have heard or understand what the Milankovitch cycles are? Two people. How many people here have ever heard of the hockey stick curve? Okay, quite a few more people. Of the people that raised your hand, how many of you could get up in front of the audience and explain it to the audience? <laughs> The reason I ask that question is that <clears throat> when we talk about global warming, when we talk about environmental change, whatever you want to call it, there's some fundamentals that most people don't understand. And so what I'd like to try to do today is to help you have a better understanding of what some of the fundamentals are that are used to help us to try to better appreciate and understand what sea level rises, what global warming is, what climate change is, all of these different things that we use that are very controversial. And I'm going to start out by telling you a couple of examples. I just recently got back from New Zealand. I was there for a month. And every national park I went to, every single one, and they have some beautiful, wonderful national parks, every one of them, the signage, the interpretive signage was all about global warming, all about environmental change. It was very little about interpreting what you were actually seeing. 
And that really surprised me. If you go to a national park in the United States, you don't hear anything about that kind of stuff. It's all about what you are seeing. What's the interpretation of what you're seeing? The message that you get in New Zealand is that if you want to preserve these beautiful places, we need to understand what global warming is, what climate change is. We don't do that here in the States. Another example I'll give you <clears throat> is about six years ago, I was in Papua New Guinea, which is still a relatively rural area. And we were doing a circumnavigation. And one of the villages we landed at, there was a gentleman who could speak perfect English. And I noticed that there was severe erosion right in front of where the village was located. And he noticed that. And he came up and he said, King Tithe. And I have to admit to you, six years ago, I had never heard the term King Tithe before. I didn't know what it was. And I asked him to explain it to me. And he said, that's when we have unusually high tides that cause a lot of erosion. Well, since then, I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot about King Tide. But isn't it interesting, here I am in Papua New Guinea, and I learned this from a villager. This is the first time I had heard the term King Tide. I hadn't heard it here in the United States prior to that trip. What I'm trying to say to you is that different parts of the world look at this process very differently than the way we do in the United States. In the United States, it tends to be more controversial. I'm not here today to try to convince you that you should or should not believe in global warming or climate change. Instead, what I'd like to try to do is talk to you about it, and then you form your own opinion. Okay? Now, the most basic term that gets misused by almost everybody, including probably <coughs> me during this presentation, is that when I say sea level change or sea level rise or whatever, most of us think that that means because there's an increase in the volume of water, that's why sea level is going up. In reality, we should all always be saying relative sea level rise because it's not just water that's coming in from the melting of ice. It's a combination of many, many things. And the biggest one that affects us right here, particularly those of us that live on the waterfront, is the fact that the crust of the earth where we are living right now is actually going down. So even if there was no additional water that was being contributed to the oceans from melting of ice, we would still have sea level rise, but it wouldn't be because of additional water. It's because of where we live. So that's what I want to try to do today, is talk about some of these concepts. I'm really relatively informal, and if anybody has a pressing question or whatever, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll try to get to that. I have so much that I want to give to you today, it's going to be difficult to get it in under the time constraints that we have. Sinking lands and rising seas, climate change, and geological evolution of the Chesapeake Bay. I don't know if many of you understand or not, but if we were living here 14,000 years ago, we would not be on the beach. 14,000 years ago, there was no Chesapeake Bay. Instead, what would have been here would have been the Susquehanna River out in a valley. We'd be looking down that valley at that river. That's how things have changed over the last 14,000 years. And by the time we get done with this presentation, hopefully you're going to have a better understanding of how it's changed through <coughs> complete Earth history. But so take a look at this first image while you're fresh in your minds. And if you look at that, we're going back over 4 billion years in Earth history. So the beginning of the Earth is right in here, and this is where we are today. And that black line that you see going through there is showing you the different relative temperatures of the Earth over 4 billion years. And if you look at the colors on here, it helps you to better understand that. The deeper the red, the warmer the Earth was at that time. And then you see some blues in there? That's when we went into glacial periods. So when you hear the Ice Age 14,000 years ago, that's only one of many, many ice ages that the Earth has had. So when you hear people say climate change is due to cycles, absolutely true. You can see it right here. There's no question that there are cycles where the Earth has gotten warmer and where the Earth has gotten cooler. I don't know how many of you can see this bottom image. It's always best to try to be up front. 
but this is from the Smithsonian Institution's Ice Age Hall that it no longer exists. So this is about 30 years old. <clears throat> but what you're looking at, very briefly, is that this is today, and this is a million years ago. And all of these ups and downs are showing you where Washington, D.C., Chesapeake Bay area, has been warmer at times, and it's also been cooler at times. So if this is where we are today, you can see that it's very clear that we are in a relatively warm period. And you can go through this entire chart, and you can see here's another warm period. In fact, it was actually warmer at this point. Here's another point in Earth's history of over a million years where it's been warmer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, if you look down here at the bottom where you have the blues, that's when it was colder. That's when we probably had other ice ages. So what I'm saying to you in a roundabout way is that not only do we have these cycles, but think about how the Chesapeake Bay has changed over that one million years. <clears throat> Chesapeake Bay, because it's relatively warm. Much of the ice in the world has melted. Sea levels are up. If we go <clears throat> anywhere from 14 to maybe 20,000 years ago, the last ice age. Things were much colder. More of the water in the oceans was captured as ice. Sea level is down. There's no Chesapeake Bay. Sea level is over 350 feet below what sea level is today, 14,000 years ago. That is a tremendous change in a relatively short geological time. So this means Chesapeake Bay, no Chesapeake Bay. Previous Chesapeake Bay, no Chesapeake Bay. Previous, previous Chesapeake Bay, no Chesapeake Bay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way back through one million years of history in this area. That's a lot of change. This is the hockey stick curve. The hockey stick curve only takes the last 1,000 years. So this is the 1,000 years ago. This is where we are today. And this 1,000 years represents that little blip on that same graph that I showed you before. Remember, the first graph, that was a million years. This graph is a thousand years. And if you look at temperature, this is the average. And you go over the first 900 years of this 1,000 year history, do you notice anything there? Is there a trend? And what is that trend? That trend, that blue line, is that it's actually gotten a little bit cooler. In the first 900 years, of the last 1,000 years of history of this area, it's gotten a little bit cooler. Not a whole lot, but it's gotten cooler. But then when you get out here, all of a sudden, bang, it's gotten warmer, significantly warmer, and it's done it in a very, very quick time over the last 100 years. And somebody who must have been a hockey fanatic came up with a concept that this, to them, looked like a hockey stick. So the general name for this curve is called the hockey stick curve. And it's this point right here in history that things seem to have changed. And we don't see this kind of abrupt change in all of the other one million years of climate recording on our Earth. And so why is that? So if you've ever heard of the Al Gore movie, film, whatever you want to call it, An Inconvenient Truth, they talked about the hockey stick curve. That was the big thing that came out in Al Gore's presentation. By the way, just to show you the other side, the alternate side of the Al Gore, there's also a book out that calls this, that calls this whole hockey stick thing nothing but a hoax. So this points out another problem. As an average citizen, how do you know what to believe? Do you believe Al Gore? Or do you believe the book that's been written that calls this whole thing a hoax? And the answer is, it's very difficult to know. You know the science guy, Bill Nye, the science guy, who, by the way, is not really a scientist, but he can talk about science in a way that makes it easy to understand. He says the biggest problem that he thinks we have is misinformation primarily from media. But the biggest media problem is internet. 
And the reason for that is that you can believe almost anything you want to believe, and you'll find something on the internet that will support that belief. If you're a flat earther, I don't know if we have any in here that will admit it, you can go on the internet and you can find hundreds and hundreds of web pages that will support that viewpoint. So how do you, as an average citizen, hopefully someone who wants to be a good citizen, how can you decide what you should believe and what you shouldn't believe? And Bill Nye said it best. He says it's very difficult. It's very difficult to know what you can and cannot believe. So what I'd like to ask you in your minds right now is to think a little bit about when you hear someone give a level report and they talk about sea level rise, when you hear a politician talk about sea level rise, almost every one of those persons that are using that term are misusing that term. They all should be saying relative sea level because that's what we're really experiencing right here. So let's continue along this trend and see where this is going to take us. So there's the red going up suddenly. Now what's the cause of that? This is where a lot of scientists say that this is human induced. This is the industrial age. This is the same curve, but now I'm showing you all the data points as best as I can. Keep in mind, we're talking about a thousand years here. But if you look very closely, each one of these look like blue lines are actually lines that are connecting dots of actual data, okay? So from a thousand years ago, right on up to the present, these are all the dots. That dark black line that you see going through there is the average of all of that data taken together. And then you'll notice that the blue, that represents temperatures that have been gathered in indirect means because we didn't have thermometers a thousand years ago, did we? So what you see up there in red, that's actually thermometer data. But what you see up there in blue is based on indirect data. So what does that mean? It means where they take drill holes in fossil corals that can be dated, and they look at the isotopes of O16 and O18. And the reason they do that is because the ratios of those two isotopes are different depending upon whether the ocean water is warmer or cooler. And so by looking at these cores in corals and knowing the dates of the corals, they can tell you this is a coral that grew when the waters were warm, this is a coral that grew when waters were cooler, and we have the dates and we put all of that information together. That's one way that they do it. The best way that they do it is ice cores. And you might be thinking to yourself, how do you find out anything about an ice core? What's captured in an ice core? Air bubbles. What are those air bubbles? Each one of those bubbles formed thousands and thousands of years ago. And it's a little tiny void filled with the atmosphere that existed at that time in Earth's history. So if you can extract those gases in that little tiny bubble, you can tell what the percentages of carbon dioxide, all the other things that make up our atmosphere. That's the principal way that they do it. And that's called ice cores. Most of the ice core studies to date have been done in Greenland. And the earliest ice core dates are 400,000 years. That means we have gas bubbles 400,000 years old where they've been able to analyze what the atmosphere was like at that time. Current studies are being done primarily in Antarctica. And they're just about ready to roll out the, la the latest data, which is going to take it back 800,000 years. And there's ice in Antarctica that's over one and a half million years old. And they're hoping eventually to be able to get cores and to actually be able to take atmospheric samples from ice that is 1.5 million years old. I hope I live to see when that data comes out, because that's going to be very, very interesting. So that's how they came up with this kind of data that you see right up and through here. And then as I said previously, everything there that is in red represents thermometer, which is the most accurate kind of data that you can get. So again, here's your hockey stick curve. 
I would say about a third of the room had heard of a hockey stick before we talked about it. Now everybody in this room, you can say you're familiar with a hockey stick and you understand what it is. Okay? Milankovitch cycles. I asked how many people in the room knew the Milankovitch cycles. Only two people raised your hand. I suspect there's more that know it, but you were shy. You were bashful. <laughs> what is the Milankovitch cycles? It's really very simple. And that is that here's the sun right there. Here's our Earth. And as you know, we rotate around the sun. But during that rotation, Sometimes we're further away from the sun, and sometimes we're closer to the sun. And for that cycle to be complete, it takes about 90,000 to 100,000 years. In other words, every time, every year that the Earth goes around the sun, each rotation after that gets a little bit different. And it starts to get a little bit further away, and a little bit further away, and then it starts to get closer and closer again. And it repeats the whole cycle. So it's just obvious to everybody here that when you're in part of that cycle where you're further away from the sun, you would expect temperatures on Earth to be cooler. And when you're closer to the sun, you would expect temperatures to be warmer. So that's a cycle. That's one of the Milankovitch cycles. Okay? A second one is right here, and that is the tilt. You all know that the Earth is not straight up and down. It actually has a tilt to it. Now that creates a problem because if you're tilted, that means, as you can see right here, in this case the Earth is tilted away, you're going to have more sunlight here and you're going to have less sunlight down there. So what happens in the northern hemisphere is not necessarily the same thing that's going to happen in the southern hemisphere because of the tilt. And as the Earth goes around, it's going to change so that now the southern hemisphere is going to be more exposed than the northern hemisphere. That's why if you go to Antarctica, you want to do it during our winter because that's summer in the southern hemisphere. If you want to go to New Zealand like I did, I chose to go during our winter because that's the New Zealand summer. You could have done it the other way around and still be a beautiful place to be, but you wouldn't want to be in Antarctica during the austral winter. You wouldn't want to be in the Arctic during the Northern Hemisphere winter. So those are the differences because of the tilt. If you're tilted over more, you could be exposed more or less to the sun. That's going to affect global temperatures on Earth. On top of that, there's a third thing, and that's the fact that the Earth wobbles. We don't spin perfectly around our orbit. We wobble a little bit. I noticed some of you were wobbling. <laughs> And as I get older, I wobble a little bit as well. But the Earth wobbles. So what's interesting about that is that if you're in part of a wobble or you're further tilted over, in addition to the Earth being more tilted over, that's going to have an even more positive or negative effect on temperatures on Earth. So all of these three cycles, you put them together, and that's called the Milankovitch cycles. And here they are down at the bottom. And so we've already talked about this. It's a 90 to 100,000 year cycle. The uh, tilt is 21.8 thousand to 24.4 thousand cycle. And then the, uh, what we call the axis rotation, that has a, about a cycle of 24,000 years. Mm -hmm. So these are cycles that we will never experience in a human lifetime. But in geological time, our Earth is experiencing these all the time. So when you look at these charts that I started out with and I showed you how every 60 to 120,000 years you could go from a period to where it was warm to a period to where it could be cooler, that can all be explained by the Milankovitch cycles. So when someone says to you, I don't believe in climate change because they're natural cycles, they do have a point. There are natural cycles. However, the hockey stick suggests that we have now altered the natural cycle. And we're going to talk more about that as we get into this. <clears throat> you probably can't see this from where you are, and that's unfortunate, because to me this is the best graphic that I have in this entire presentation. And this is from Geographic Magazine, 
October 2007. I kept that particular insert because to me it's an amazing, amazing, simple graph. And the reason that it's amazing is what it shows you. This is CO2, this line right here, this carbon dioxide, okay? This is temperature. This is sea level. And this right here, that's the line of its cycles. All shown to you in a very, very simple graph. And look what it does. You have a peak right here in CO2, you have a peak right here in temperature, you have a peak right here in sea level, and you can't see it because it's partially hidden, but you have a peak right here in the Melanchthon cycle. Everything fits. It fits beautifully. And if you continue on down, you can see another pipe, another spike. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. And then what happens when you get out here? For those of you that are up close, what does the Milankovitch cycle say we should be doing right now? We should be getting cooler. <clears throat> Let's go to the next slide, which you saw before. And I'm going to repeat what I've already said. In the first 900 years of the last 1,000 years of temperature in the northern hemisphere, it was getting cooler. It fits the Milankovitch cycle, doesn't it? And then all of a sudden you get to around 1900, the industrial age, all of the hydrocarbons are being burnt, going up into the atmosphere, creating a greenhouse situation. We're now getting warmer. It does not fit the Milankovic cycle. It's the only time in the last 400,000 years that we know of that it has not fit. There's no coordination. That's why many, many scientists, you can easily say most scientists, believe that humans are the cause. It's really that simple. This is Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay area. What it looks like today. This is what it looked like during maximum glaciation. Do you see any Chesapeake Bay out there? Do you see any Delaware Bay out there? No. Sea level is 350 feet minimum below what it is today. So imagine if you lived here and were there people in this area 14,000 years ago? Sure there were. Where were they all living? If you lived at that time, you would probably want to be down to where the Susquehanna River is. Because that's where you're going to have your best opportunity for a diversity of foods that you would want. Whether you're talking about fish, whether you're talking about animals that are coming down to use that area, or where streams are running down into that. So where are all the Paleo-Indian sites in the Chesapeake Bay? They're mostly under the Chesapeake Bay today because that's where they were living, down near the bottom of that valley. There's a few that are up that have been found, but nowhere near the same amount that you find when you go out into the western United States where they don't have these relative sea level issues that we have here on the East Coast. So this is what the Chesapeake Bay would have looked like 13,000 years ago. You can see the Susquehanna River. You can see the Patuxent River, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is what it would have looked like about 8,000 years ago. Definitely lots of people living in the Chesapeake area 8,000 years ago. And then that's what it looked like about 4,000 years ago. And that's because, again, the Earth has been getting relatively warmer. A lot of the ice in the continental glaciers has melted. Sea level has come up. Relative sea level has come up. And if you go and take a look at the bathometry of the Chesapeake Bay, you can actually see the old channel of the Susquehanna River. And you can see it right here. So that's where the water would have been 14,000 years ago. It would not have been all over this area like we see today. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? The deepest parts in the Chesapeake Day, Bay today are like around 150 feet. And if sea level is over 350 feet below that, you can see why that means that all of those streams and rivers that are coming out of the Appalachian Mountains, they went all the way across what is now called the Continental Shelf before they reached the ocean. I meant to point out one other thing to you. 
I hope you can notice that there is Calvert County. We're located approximately right there. This is the Patuxent River. Do you see this flat area right here? Doesn't that look like an, an anomaly? Do you notice how you have all of this um, topography up through here compared to what you have on the eastern shore, which is relatively flat? And then look at, look at this. And you see what looks like an escarpment right there? That's where sea level 120,000 years ago, when it was warmer than what it is today, and sea level was even higher. <clears throat> and that's a terrace that had been eroded into the landscape. <coughs> and then when sea level went back down, it exposed this flat terrace. And the best terrace that you can see anywhere around here is right down there in St. Mary's County. And so that brings me to the next slide. This is Patuxent Naval Air Station. Why is Patuxent Naval Air Station located where it is? Because it was so flat. If you want to have runways, you don't want to have to go out and level hills and whatnot. You want to take the flattest place you can get. And that is an old marine terrace when Earth 120,000 years ago was even warmer than it is today. And that had been eroded out into this terrace with bluffs on the side similar to the cliffs that we have today. So there's erosion going on today on our cliffs, just like there was 120,000 years ago, cliffs that formed along the top of that particular terrace. Just quickly, some real brief, easy geology for you. Obviously, this is the state of Maryland. I think you all know that, um, let me just go back one now. It's not going to go back. We'll, we'll stick with this one. Um, we're located approximately <coughs> Here's the Patuxent River. Everything that you see south of this red line, that's referred to as the Coastal Plain Province. That's a geological province. It means, geologically speaking, almost everything in that province is very, very similar. So what's the similarity of the Coastal Plain? Well, number one, if you have the word plain on it, it it's kind of telling you it's relatively flat. That's one thing. But coastal is also telling you that where we live are sediments that have eroded from the Appalachian Mountains. They're unconsolidated. What I mean by that is they're not cemented. So you have sand, silts, and gravels, and they're all loose. They're not turned into rock. We don't have rock in the coastal plain. There actually are a couple of exceptions. I don't have the time to get into it. But essentially, it's unconsolidated. It's the natural sediments that have eroded out of the Appalachian Mountains. But if you go to the Piedmont province, which is right here, that's hardcore metamorphic rock. Some of the hardest rock you can find anywhere on Earth. And that's because that's the root of the Appalachian Mountains that have been severely eroded down. And all of those sediments that have eroded out of those mountains coming down through the streams and the rivers have formed the coastal plain where we live today. We essentially are living on a sand pile that eroded out of the Appalachian Mountains. Don't like to think of it that way, but that's what we live on. <laughs> now, if you're a river or a stream and you're coming down over that hard, metamorphic rock, and then suddenly you hit the coastal plain, what's going to happen? You're going to be able to erode much more easily and much more quickly. And that's exactly what you see right here at Great Falls, which is on the Potomac River. All along the demarcation, that red line between the Piedmont and the coastal plain, is where you have what is known as the fall line. That's where you have the falls and the rapids of all of the rivers and the streams that are coming off of the Appalachian Mountains. And if you were an early settler, where would you want to point your town or your place that you wanted to live? You wanted it to be near the falls or the rapids because that was your source of energy. That's where you put your mills. That's where your grist mills were. That's where your lumber mills were. You were taking advantage of the natural topography. You were taking advantage of the geology. And that's also the natural head of navigation for most of the rivers. And what connects all of those points along that red line right there today? Anybody want to guess? Here's another way to look at it. 
this is all coastal plain, all the Delmarva Peninsula, southern parts of New Jersey, all parts of that big sand pile. And then you can see the Piedmont next to it. That demarcation going right down there that forms that arc, that's where U.S. Route 1 runs. And U.S. Route 1 is connecting all of the major towns all along the east coast of the United States. And the reason those towns are there was because of the geology. It was to take advantage of the power, the natural power of the water. If you take the Patuxent River, where are the falls on the Patuxent River? The Patuxent River divides. You have the little and the big Patuxent. You have Savage, Savage Mills. You guys have all heard of that, haven't you? And Laurel. Those are the two mill complexes that were established on the Patuxent River. That's why they're there. So you connect all of those places together. And can you see that kind of a whitish line? This is a satellite image. That white represents development. That's where you have high intensity development all along the East Coast. And look where it is. It's right smack on the fall line. That's not a coincidence. So that line right there is the fall line. And to take it even further, you can go right up the Mississippi and you can go right down through Texas. And that's where the fall line is, all throughout the east and the southeast portions of the United States. And then take a look at all of these cities. Boston, Trenton, Wilmington, Baltimore, Fredericksburg, Richmond, Petersburg, Roanoke, Riley, Columbia, Augusta, all of them are located on the fall line for exactly the same reason. And most people never even think about that. <laughs> this is something that we've only kind of touched a little bit upon, but this is called tectonic subsidence. And I don't have a better image because all the better images only are localized. And I wanted to show you the same <coughs> entire region that we've been talking about. And this is the only one that I can find. But what you're looking at here are lines that connect, and I'll show it to you right here, centimeters per 100 years of subsidence, okay? So in 100 years, that represents the number of centimeters that the land is subsiding. Subsiding means going down. So if we look at where we are right now, we're approximately right up and through here, we are at a topo line of 20. That means right where we are right now, every 100 years, the Earth's crust is subsiding approximately 20 centimeters. Another way to look at that is that Solomon's, Maryland, where I usually give this particular lecture, which is located right down there, is subsiding <coughs> about 22 centimeters, which equals about 8.7 inches in 100 years. That's not insignificant. Look at some of the other places on here. Take, for example, right here. This is the Norfolk area. It is subsiding at over 42 centimeters every 100 years. So if you think it's bad here, it could be worse. So let's compare it now to the east coast of the United States. And what you're looking at is that this section right here represents what's called the Salisbury Embayment. That's an area where the Earth's crust is going down. But to the north of it, you have the South New Jersey Arch. That's where the Earth's crust is going up. And to the south of the Salisbury Embayment, you have the Norfolk Arch, which is another place where the Earth's crust is going up. And if we go up and down the whole coast, you can see up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It depends on where you live as to what's going on. But all of this plays a role in relative sea level, doesn't it? So this is just to show you that area that we were talking about. So here's an example. I'm going to have to use a word. I try not to use big words, but I love this word. It's called isostasy. Okay, everybody say it in unison. Isostasy. Don't you love it? It just rolls right off the tongue. What does isostasy mean? It means it's the Earth's crust trying to reach an equilibrium. The Earth's crust is always trying to do that. We do not have a, spur a perfect sphere. So like an isosceles triangle, it's an equal-sided triangle. It has the same root as isostasy. Okay? So what you're looking at here is that if you have a big mountain, 
and a lot of that mountain becomes eroded away, you have now changed the density and the weight over the Earth's crust. You have taken weight away from the top of that mountain and you've added weight over here to the side of that mountain. You have changed the isostasy of the Earth's crust. So what that means is that because now the mountain has lost some of its density, the Earth is going to try to rebound that back up to reach that equilibrium. And because you've added weight here, the Earth's crust is going to go down to try to compensate for that additional weight. Okay? So we can call that the Salisbury Embayment and the mountain range, the Appalachian Mountains. You can do the same thing through many, many different places throughout the world. Imagine what it was like 20 to 14,000 years ago when there was a continental ice shelf or a continental glacier, if you want to call it that, that sat over most of North America. What do you think that did to the isostasy of Earth? Can you imagine that in some places the thickness of the ice was over three miles? Imagine the amount of weight. And what did it do? It caused the Earth's crust underneath that glacier to move down. It subsided. It subsided significantly. But what a lot of people don't realize is that because we're south of that, we figure, okay, we don't have to worry about that. Yes, we do. <coughs> and here's why. Here's the continental crust. Here's the continental glacier. Extra weight. Boom. There's a four bulge. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this term before or not. But if this is the continental ice sheet, it's depressed down on the Earth's surface. And immediately in front of that bulge, it's caused the Earth's crust to actually move up. It's like if you put your hand in a mud puddle and you push down on the mud, what's going to happen? In between your fingers, it's going to come up. That's what's happened here. And where do we live? We live in the forebulge of where the last major glacier was. And so what does that mean to us? It means that where we live, approximately right in through here, there's about an 18 to 20 meter rise in the Earth's crust that took place because of the last continental glacier. And that equals to about 59 feet. So we have risen up about 59 feet over what we originally were prior to that last glacier forming 14 to 20,000 years ago. Now that ice is melted. Isostasy is beginning to take place. So the Earth is rebounding back up where the ice was located and what's happening at the forebulge? It's going back down. And that's what you can see on this slide right here. So let's say that this is North Beach, and then go back. This is North Beach right here. During the formation of the glacier, the four balls caused North Beach to go up. Now the ice is melted, <coughs> isostatic rebound. The earth is coming up here, and because of the four balls, the earth is going back down there. That's exactly what we're experiencing where we live right now. So when I show you those previous graphs about the tectonic areas that are going down, that's why it's going down in the Chesapeake Bay area. It's the four bulge, and it's this concept called isostasy that's taking place. There's another reason in parts of the Chesapeake Bay that it's going down, and that's because there was a meteoritic impact down near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Many of you probably have heard about that. But if you go back to that tectonic chart that I showed you, and I mentioned 42 centimeters per 100 years of subsidence, that's primarily due to that crater impact because when that meteor hit, it caused all of the rock and the debris in it to form a big crater, and all of the rock behind it became splintered, which is referred to as a breccia, a very loose, broken up amount of rock that's been settling back down ever since it was disrupted by that meteoritic impact. And so that's what you're looking at right here. So here's the crater, here's that breccia that I was telling you about, and now we have all of the settling that's taking part down in that crater, which is causing the Earth's crust to go down. There's another issue that they have down in the Norfolk area, even worse than we have any place else in the Chesapeake Bay. 
and that is that they're extracting fresh water at a rate that is so intense that the cone of fresh water cannot replace itself. And when you take fresh water out at a point where it cannot refresh itself, that also causes the Earth's crust to come down. So they have a triple effect going on down in Norfolk. And when we get to the end of this talk, if I don't run out of time, which I think I am, um, just I'll give you a, pre, a little pre-note on it. The U.S. Navy right now has 14 piers at the naval base in Norfolk. This is the largest naval base in the entire world. 14 piers. Those piers right now are in threat of being subsided because of relative sea level to the point that all of them are being rebuilt to the tune of $40 million a pier. That's almost half a billion dollars just because of relative sea level and the subsidence issues that we've been talking about here today. And this is uh, one of the Virginia newspapers that talks about all of this, and I just wanted to point this particular out to you. And I'll even read it to you in case you can't see it in the back. One third of the sea level rise, and they should be saying relative sea level rise, can be attributed to two geological factors. Post-glacial rebound, which we've already talked about, and the ancient impact crater. We don't have to worry about the impact crater here. We do have to worry about that. Someone brought up the issue about uh, the continental shelf, and we really hadn't talked about that up to that point, but I want to talk about it right now. If this is what we call the coastal plain, and this is what we think of as the edge of the continent, because that's where the ocean is located. But geologically, that is not the edge of the continent. That's, we only call it the edge of the continent because we don't care about what's under the water. <laughs> Well, we should care, but we don't care. This is the edge of the continent right here. This is referred to as the continental shelf. So I mentioned earlier, when sea level is lower, this whole area has been exposed to land, just like the land that you see here today. When you get to the edge of the continent, then you have what's referred to as the continental slope that then goes down to the abyssal plain or the bottom of the ocean. And a better way to look at it, but it's very small, and for you in the back, you probably can't see it. But right here is the continental shelf. Here's the continental slope, and there's the abyssal plain. The reason I'm showing you this particular one is that all of these squares that you see right here represent fossils of mammoths and mastodons that have been found. They've been dredged up by clam dredgers. Why do you have mastodon and mammoth teeth out on the continental shelf? because that's where they lived 12 to 14,000 years ago. They were happy to be out there. They had no idea that relative sea level was going to cause them to have to move. And then the other thing that's on here that you might just be able to make out, the circle is freshwater peats. Well, how can you have a freshwater peat on a continental shelf that's now underwater? Well, the answer is that it wasn't always underwater. And as you know, peats form at sea level. They don't form above it, and they don't form below it. I'm talking about marine peats now. I'm not talking about peats like you get in the Falkland Islands or anything like that. Here's another example. This is the east coast of the United States. This hatched area is the continental shelf. All of these circles represent fossils of mammoths and mastodons. All the ones that you see out here in the hatched area, they have a number next to it. That's the date. That's a radiocarbon date that's been gotten on that particular fossil. So again, I'm just trying to emphasize to you that this is how the Earth's crust is changing all the time, how relative sea levels are changing all of the time. This is uh, taken right out of a research paper, and I wanted to show it to you because uh, I, I kind of find it interesting. Right here, the squares represent tide gauge measurements for Baltimore. The circles are from Solomon's. That's the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. They have one of the longest recorded measurement data series for the Chesapeake Bay. And then if you look at the triangles, this represents Cambridge. And so if you look from 1900 to the year 2000, and we could extrapolate it right on up to 2020 if you wanted to, you can see that according to this, sea level in the Chesapeake Bay has changed about one foot since 1938. 
Now we all know by now that it's a combination of many, many things. It's relative sea level. It's not just volume of water that's caused this change. But the reason I wanted to show you to it is that this is out of scientific paper that was published only 10 years ago, and they're still not using relative sea level. And then if you go to the Department of Interior, this is their own data. This is showing you historic rate of sea level rise. They don't call it relative. For various locations of the United States, and this is in millimeters, not centimeters, but in millimeters per year. And you can see that here in Solomon's, it's 3.3. If you go down to Hampton, Virginia, 4.3. But look at some of these other places. Padre Island, Texas, 5.1. Freeport, Texas, 14. Sabine Pass, Texas, 13.2. Grand Island, Louisiana, 10.5. Those places in the Gulf of Mexico, the relative sea level differences there are three times greater than what we're experiencing right here. So if you want to live on the waterfront down in the Gulf of Mexico, I think about that twice. <laughs> but on the other hand, you look at what Jen's, what's going on here. Seattle, Washington is only 2.0. But look at Sitka, Alaska, minus 2. Point, I think that's 2. I don't think it's 20. Yeah, 2.2. And Juneau, Alaska is 12.4. Now, if it's a minus, what the heck's going on here? It means that the Earth's crust is coming up faster than sea level. So depending upon where you live in the world, you really don't care too much about sea level except that you're losing some of your water from it. And that's exactly what's happening in Alaska. So another way to look at that is notice the slope of this data, which is all tide pH. From New York, Baltimore, Key West, San Francisco, they all have about the same relative sea level differences. But look at Galveston up at the top. The slope is much greater. And the reason the slope is much greater there is because the land's going down so much faster. But if you go to the bottom one, which is Sitka, Alaska, you have a reverse slope. And the reverse slope there is because the land is going up so fast, it's going up faster than sea level. So the relative sea level in Sitka, Alaska is a minus. And you can look at the entire United States, including Alaska, and all of these arrows are showing you the average relative, it says relative up there, thank goodness, between 1960 and 2015. And you'll see that the red represents greater than 8 inches during that period of time. And you can see we've got some red ones right up here in the mid-Atlantic, but the greatest ones are right down here in the Gulf Coast, particularly in Texas. And then if you look at the blues, you can see this is where you have very, very small or even negative relative sea level rises. And you see those for the most part in Alaska and a little bit up there in Washington State. So if you're looking for a waterfront, this is the kind of thing you might want to look at. <laughs> because in the long term, it can make a difference. Someone at my age, I don't worry about it. But for my grandson, I would worry about that. So global temperature rising. Again, I don't know if you can see this very well in the back, but what you're looking at here is from 1970, they say 2020, but it doesn't, the data only goes up to about 2017. And all of these different colors here represent different data sets that have been collected by different organizations throughout the world. So it's not just one data set. It could be NOAA. It could be a foreign country. It could be a composite of many, many different countries that got together, different scientific institutions. All of them, you take all of that data and you put it together, and all of these colors show that they pretty much match. You don't see a whole lot of differences here. And what that tells me as a scientist is that this is good data. And so what you're seeing here is that from 1970 up to about 2017, Again, you can see these ups and downs in temperature. But what is the general trend? The general trend is that it has been getting warmer since 1970. And it's significantly been getting warmer since 1970. And if you look at the data sets, 
there's only a couple of places where you see something that's a little bit out of whack. Like this data set is significantly different than what the rest of the data sets are. But for the most part, they're right on target. They, all of this data agrees with one another. It's telling you this is a trend that you should be able to trust. Now, if you were a non-believer, what you could do is you could take this section of the graph from here to there, or this section of the graph from maybe there to there, however you wanted to do it, and you could say, here's proof. We're actually getting colder. And that would be true. That data would, <coughs> present, would show that it's actually gotten colder. So you've got to look at what your data is from. You can't compare northern hemisphere data with southern hemisphere data. You can't compare east coast data with west coast data. You have to compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. And if you do that, then you're going to have a better understanding of what actually is going on. So the, my advice to you is when you see something that doesn't make sense, take a look at it and try to figure out what's going on. Because if they're only giving you a small piece of the data, they're probably trying to convince you of something that the data doesn't really show. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff on the internet, an awful lot of that kind of stuff on the internet. So what this means is that most of these different blips that you see, the ups and downs, they believe are being caused by something we've never talked about yet, but that's the El Nino and the La Nina cycles. And you, I think everybody here knows about that. That's where you get either cold or warm water in the Pacific and how that affects other things throughout the world. So here's another phenomenon that's not really part of the Milankovitch cycles that helps us to understand why we have some of these different kinds of changes. And I'm beginning to run out of time here, so uh, I'm going to try to go through this, the rest of this relatively quickly. Um, <clears throat> I want to get to a summary point. So I'm going to skip. Yeah, th this is a good one. Um, this is warming due to greenhouse gases. A lot of people say, well, how do you know it's CO2? I've always been told that it has to do with solar radiation. Or, I mean, we've all heard all these different scenarios. This is a summary of all of the different major things that can contribute to global warming. And for those of you in the back, you probably can't see it very well, but I'll just try to give you some examples. So here's solar. That's this kind of yellow line that runs right in through here. And you notice there's a few little blips on the solar, but for the most part, nothing really significant about solar. Take a look at land use. Land use is this blue line running right down and through there. And because of land use issues through most of the world, we've actually done a better job so that we actually have had a positive effect it's not a major positive effect, but it's been a positive effect. A more important one is aerosols. Look at the decrease in aerosols, the effect. And that's primarily because we've gotten rid of those chlorocarbons that were used in um, cooling plants and in your home um, air conditioners and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, they've just discovered that in China, there's some illegal reproduction of that that's being put back into the atmosphere, so we're beginning to lose some of the gains that have been made on aerosphere, uh, aerosols. But take a look at greenhouse gases. All of these individual black dots that you see right there, that's the data points. And the red is meant to be the average. And so what you're looking at here, greenhouse gases is the biggest effect that we have right now on temperatures from 1950 up to essentially the present time. This is data that's coming right out of the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, University of Maryland. If you've ever gone to their lecture series down in Solomon's, you've seen the same graph. Warming of ocean waters, there's no doubt about it. <clears throat> this is 1955, 2010, but again, we've got a blip. So if you took just that portion right there, you could argue to somebody that, no, ocean waters aren't getting warmer, ocean waters are getting cooler. And that would be true between about 1961 and maybe 1970. But if you look at the overall trend, you can see that ocean temperatures are actually getting higher. 
And what happens when something gets warmer? <coughs> Why does a hot air balloon work? Because you're heating up the air, you're causing it to be less dense, it expands, it's lighter than the surrounding air, which is more dense, and so you lift it upward. That's the same thing that happens to our oceans. You warm up the oceans and they expand. That's without the addition of any new water coming in from the melting of ice. So even if there was no ice in the world, but you continue to have an increase in the temperature of the oceans, you would still have a positive net increase in relative sea level. And I've already talked about all of those, so I'm not going to do that. Just a summary. Um, global ocean water warming, which produces thermal expansion. We just talked about it. Global glacier and ice sheet melting. There's no doubt that that's not happening right now. All you have to do is go anywhere in the world and you'll see it. Isostatic effects, we've talked about that. That's the isostasy, the word that you're all going to remember. You're going to use it in a sentence tonight at dinner. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be impressed, everybody. Subsidence, that's a, we've already talked about the four bulbs. Don't need to go into that anymore. Extraction of groundwater, we've talked about that. We've done a pretty good job. Um, Global sea level rise, they should say relative, but they don't, is about two to four millimeters per year in Virginia. It's about the same for Maryland. Land sinking, the isostasy issue is about one to three millimeters per year. So you can see that it's a combination of the two. It's not just one. And I'm going to forget all that stuff. I'm going to forget about this. Um, Calvert Marine Museum. This is Solomon's. Albert Marine Museum is located right there, right where they project this entire area to be flooded due to the surging relative sea level. That's an issue that we're going to have to face. I'm going to get out of all this stuff. I'm going to forget all of this. We don't have time. Too bad. That's some good stuff here. <laughs> For example, look at this. Parsons Island, I don't know if you know where that is. That's uh, just south of uh, Kent Island. This is uh, May 20, 2013. You can just begin to see something <coughs> beginning to come out. August, you can see a little bit more. By the 25th, you can see that this is actually the, a well shaft made out of brick. Here's October 16th. Here's March. It's almost completely exposed. This is not due to sea level rise. This is all due to wave action. <coughs> which we haven't talked about yet. Most of the erosion that we have in the Chesapeake Bay is not due to sea level rise. Sea level rise plays a very, very insignificant role to that. It's wave erosion. That's what's doing it. And everybody keeps talking about sea level rise. In this case, the erosion is primarily due to wave action. So here's that same well. Here's after it collapsed. This has been very significantly documented. This is the hog's head that was at the very bottom of the well. And that's what it looked like from May 2013 to May 2017. You've had 32 feet of erosion. And that's all due to wave action. That's wave erosion. In that amount of time, sea level differences would have been less than a millimeter. Sea level rise did not play a role in what we're seeing right there. Yes, ma'am. Is the wave action due to storms? Wave action is due to a lot of things. But the biggest part of wave action is fetch. And if you haven't heard that term before, I'm not talking about throwing a ball for your dog. I'm talking about unobstructed water where wind can blow. And the longer the distance is before that wind is impeded, that's called fetch. A greater fetch means that you have greater wave heights, which are going to have more erosional energy when they finally hit land. And in the Chesapeake Bay, if you have a wind coming out of the northeast, that's going to be the most erosive wind that you can get right here at North Beach. <clears throat> because you've got one heck of a fetch coming across there. If you have a wind coming from the west, you don't have any effect. People on the, west, on the eastern shore, they're going to have an effect because of fetch. We're not going to have that here. So fetch is the big issue, where you're located. If you have a waterfront property with a lot of fetch in front of it, 
we got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? What is the source of the fetch changing? The force of the, the fetch is the wind. Right, no, but why is it changing? Uh, I mean, more severe Atlantic it's more severe, right? Well, depending upon the highs and the lows are going to depend on the directions of the winds. And as they move through, the wind directions are well, going to change. I understand that, but why is it changing so much that you would have this amount over here? This is normal wave action on Parsons Island. This is normal. This is not abnormal. <coughs> so if you own that land and you wanted to protect it, what most people would tend to do is put riprap out in front of it. Is riprap going to effectively stop that? It's going to slow it down. It's not going to actually stop it. Here in Calvert Cliffs, we in the wintertime have freezing and falling that can take anywhere from an inch to three inches of the face of the cliff off every winter. Now, times 10, times 100, think about how much of that. That's just from freezing and fall action on the face of the cliff. If you put riprap out there, if you put bulkheads out there, that's not going to stop freezing and falling. It's also not going to stop when you get enormous amounts of rain that fill up the, the sediments that are up on the top of the cliffs that they slump off. They're going to reach what's called the angle of repose. An angle of repose, if, like if this is your cliffs, and it's relatively stable, but if you get a lot of water in here, makes this unstable, this will slump off into the bay. And anything that you can do at the base of the toe to try to stop that erosion, it's not going to work. I mean, I, I don't like to be a purveyor of no hope, but don't waste your money if you don't know what you're doing. It's expensive to do all of this stuff. I have riprap at my home. I live on the waterfront. In fact, I think I have a slide. Gracie, if you want to cut me off, go for it. If I showed you this picture, how many people would say that that's Ramble Cliffs? <coughs> it looks very similar to Ramble Cliffs, and you've seen, you've seen this kind of thing at Ramble Cliffs. This is not Ramble Cliffs. This is Lake Michigan. Wow. So how could sea level have affected this? Because Lake Michigan isn't even on the sea. Sea level's having no effect on Lake Michigan. This is all wave action. This is wave erosion. And that's what you're seeing primarily here in the Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I should maybe get out while I get into it. <laughs> this, I, I once said this is my house, and people thought I actually lived <laughs> This is my waterfront. I don't live in that little thing. But the reason I'm showing this to you is that this was taken during the Nor'easter. Water. Sea levels up high. But my wife and I bought the property in 76. We built the pool, the uh, pier in 78. Since we built the dock, we've raised it a foot. I've raised the shed a foot. And I've extended the dock 30 feet landward. Not out into the river, landward. Now, why is that? because of relative sea level. I live on the waterfront where the land is going down and sea level is coming up. And that's what I've experienced since 1976 where I live. Okay, on that happy note, yes. great, Grace and I will end. Thank you all very much. lecture for the winter and there are some flyers on the back table. Michael Kent is a local gentleman who's written a book about the African American history in Calvert County and he's going to talk about slavery and how much the churches and the schools meant to the African American community after slavery. So he'll be here two Sundays from now from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock and thank you.